ज्ञानाजनचलाखा चक्षुरूनिधम जेना तस्म श्री गुरव नम नम ओ विष्णुपदाय कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमथे भक्तिवेदांत स्वामी निठिनामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषा शून्यवादी पश्चतारिणे नमो महाबरण्याय कृष्ण प्रेम प्रदाय थे कृष्णाय कृष्ण चैतन्य नाम ने गौरवेशे नम श्रीकृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्रीअदाधार शिवासी कौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे पंचकूप्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति भावनेभ्य वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम It is my great honor and pleasure to be with all of you this evening in this very beautiful, esteemed, um, sacred place. Thank you for inviting me. I was asked to speak on the subject of unleashing the power of the soul. As I was seeing the beautiful nature, the trees, the lawns, the forests, the gardens, the lakes, driving up here, something came to my remembrance which I'd like to share with you. A few years ago, I went with two busloads of teenagers on an excursion. We went to a place called King's Canyon, which is in Northern California. Have any of you ever been there? It is a redwood forest, and we walked in in this beautiful natural setting and eventually came to the largest tree on planet Earth. It's a giant sequoia tree. They named it the General Sherman tree for whatever reason. <laughs> but this tree is, according to the scientists, at least 2,200 years old. I read a little description where it described if a family of six, or actually if you, if you hollowed the tree out and filled it with water, a family of six could get full bath for 27 years. And if a, a little mouse looked up at a six-foot man it would be the same proportionate difference as a six-foot man looking up at this tree. So we were gathered around, and it's quite awesome when you're with 
something so large and so old. <laughs> and I asked the crowd of teenagers, if this tree could speak a message to humanity, what would it say to us? Now, I don't know if it's a boy or girl, so I couldn't say he or she. But what would the tree say to us? This tree was over a hundred years old at the time of Jesus Christ. It was standing here before the fall of the Roman Empire. It was standing here through the Mongolian Wars and, the, and before any people of white complexion ever stepped foot on American soil as we know it. It's been here through the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II. What would the message be? And several of the boys told really joking um, remarks. And one girl, she was 14 years old, she took a deep breath and started to cry. She was so emotional. Everyone stood in silence to hear what she had to say. She tried to speak, but she was so choked up by tears of emotion. And this is what she said. She said, can't we hear what this tree is trying to tell us? Why do you human beings waste your time obsessing over and fighting over such superficial things? Time is so precious. You live such short lives. Why don't you take seriously what's actually important? Your, your spiritual relationships with each other, with nature, and with God. As she cried, we all were thinking, it seems like the tree's actually speaking through her. <laughs> But her words, coming from a child, really struck our hearts. Time is precious. And we don't live so long compared to that tree. Just today I was with my father. He's 91 years old. And he was telling stories <laughs> just this afternoon uh, to myself and my brother about how when he was about seven or eight years old, on Sunday nights, the whole family would gather in a circle around a radio and listen. And he was telling me all the shows every day on the radio. This was in the 1920s. And he said, it was like yesterday. He said, in fact, I could remember those days much better than all the things in between. <laughs> Where does life go? It flies so fast. And the most precious thing in life is each moment we have. Time is so mystical. You cannot see it, you cannot touch it, hear it, feel it, taste it, smell it. But yet,
time is in the process of extinguishing the sun, evaporating every ocean, pulverizing every planet, and what to speak of our little bodies. Bribes cannot corrupt it. Beauty cannot seduce it. The greatest militaries with all of its arsenals cannot stop its progress for even a moment. There's a verse in the Bhagavad Purana that with every rising and setting of the sun, whoever we are, whatever we have, we're one day closer to death. But for those who utilize their time for a spiritual higher purpose, with every rising and setting of the sun, we are one day closer to eternal life. The basic question that is there in so many of the great philosophies and religions of the world is who am I? Unless we know who we are, we cannot really understand our relationships with each other, with the environment, what to speak of the higher spiritual powers. The Bhagavad Gita tells, Najayate mriyate vakadachit nayan bhutpa bhavita vayam bhuya. Nahanyate hanyamane saride. That we are the eternal force. That person that's within the heart, who's seeing through the eyes and hearing through the ears and tasting through the tongue and thinking through the brain and loving through the heart. The nature of that living force in Sanskrit is Atma. It is eternal, undying. It's by nature full of knowledge and full of happiness. And what is that happiness? Things could, good sub could give some pleasure to the body mind and senses. But things can never give fulfillment to the heart. Only love can give fulfillment to the heart. To give love and to receive love. That is the f most fundamental need of every living being. Ananda mayo bhyashat, the Brahma Sutra says that we're all seeking pleasure. And we're all trying to stop what interferes with our pleasure, which is pain. And whether it's a little ant crawling on our kitchen counter, or whether it's a CEO of an international corporation, everyone's looking for pleasure. And everyone has a relative way of finding that pleasure. Where does that natural characteristic that we all have come from? It comes from the natural love of the soul. In the Bible, that same principle is explained. What profiteth a man who gains the whole world but loses his immortal soul. A few years ago, I was speaking at the House of Lords in London, and I spoke so many things. But one thing I said, everyone clapped. Now, I'm just a little swami who hasn't had a bank account since 1969. It was in the Highland Park First National Bank. 
And I haven't signed a check since then either. And there were lords and ladies and dukes, duchesses, members of parliaments, millionaires, billionaires, rabbis, priests. But one thing I said, they all clapped really enthusiastically, which was real simple. I said, you can tell how rich you are by counting how many things you have that money cannot buy. And sometime later, I was in Chicago, in downtown, and a CEO of a corporation invited me to meet with him and his, the CEO and the COO and the CMO and the and CFO. <laughs> I don't know what they all mean, but they were all at the table. And, and he saw the YouTube where I spoke that. And he said, that is so true. He said, I just came here today on my private jet. He said, I'm a billionaire, but I can tell you that the most important things in life money cannot buy. And he went through about a five minute list of all the good things that money cannot buy. I asked him, then why do you work so hard for money? <laughs> He gave a really good answer. He said, the most important things in life money cannot buy, but it's nice to have the things that money can buy. <laughs> so I thought that was quite honest. <clears throat> because the heart is seeking love. In 1971, I believe it was, I was in Calcutta, and I visited Mother Teresa. And we sat, just the two of us, in a little room alone on two chairs, and we were talking. And she said something that really um, found a place in my heart. She said, the greatest problem in the world is hunger. She said, not hunger of the stomach. If you give somebody some food, you could solve the stomach hunger. The real problem is hunger of the heart. And she said, I go to Los Angeles and New York and London, to Paris, to Moscow, and I see even the wealthiest, most powerful people are starving. Because only love, only to love and be loved, can satisfy the heart. And the origin of that love is the love between the soul and the Supreme Soul, the soul and God. It is described in the Srimad Bhagavat that when you water the root of a tree, naturally that water extends to every part of the tree. The branches, the twigs, the flowers, the leaves. In the same way, when we actually awaken from within us our own spiritual potential, that love, then it naturally extends in the form of compassion and love to all beings. I traveled looking for truth, looking for meaning. In 1970, I left my home here in northern Illinois and traveled across Europe, traveled across the Middle East, traveled into India. I hitchhiked the whole way because I didn't have money. It took six months to get from London to the Himalayas, and I studied many different spiritual traditions. And I really gained great inspiration. But I was very troubled. This was just after living as a teenager in the 1960s. 
so much hate, so much war, so much prejudice against people because of their religion or the color of their skin or their sex. So much hate in the name of a loving God. I really wanted to find something that would bring unity and harmony and meaning to my life. And I came to the conclusion it, was, it must be something spiritual. I heard Gandhi's words, be the change you want to see in the world. So that really made sense to me. And while I was in India and traveling, I got the Bhagavad Gita. And I heard my, who later I accepted as my guru, Srila Prabhupada, I heard him cite a verse. And when I heard this particular verse, according to my state of consciousness and what I was experiencing, what is I was looking for, I thought, this is it. May I share the verse with you? It really changed my life. Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gabihastini suni jaiva swapake chapandita samadarshana. What is real knowledge? What is wisdom? What is true inner wealth? It's not about the titles we have or the things that we have. It's about who we truly are. That true wealth is within all of us. And what is that wealth? This verse tells that a true wealthy and wise person is one who sees every living being with equal vision. Whether they are black or white or red or yellow or brown, male or female, whether they're Hindus or Muslims or Jews or Jains or Christians or Sikhs or Zoroastrians or Buddhists or agnostics or atheists, whether they are rich or poor, educated or uneducated, the Gita goes to the extent of saying whether they are humans or dogs or cats or cows or elephants or trees, wherever there is life, there is a sacred, eternal part of God. Every living being is a child of God. We cannot love God without loving God's children. We can't know ourself and not see the intimacy of our relationship on the spiritual platform with the souls of all other living beings. Life is sacred. Paradukha dukhi. This is a sacred principle. That an enlightened person is not one who can just do magic tricks. It's not a person who can just attract millions of people by their oratory skills. An enlightened person is one who other people's happiness is their happiness. And other people's suffering is their suffering. This is compassion. And this is the greatest need in the world today. When we connect with our own soul, we realize that there is a power infinitely higher than my mind, my intelligence, and that my senses that I can tune into. And in the path that I follow, bhakti, we try to tune in to the power of grace. 
grace is sweet, grace is gentle. Gen grace in the Vedic tradition is the feminine aspect of the divine, but grace is all-powerful. It can forgive all of our transgressions. Grace can empower us to reach and find things that are way out of our capacity to do so. It can restore us and ultimately awaken our potential. There's a beautiful poem. It explains in Sanskrit poetry, the symbol of beauty in this world is a blue lotus flower. Pink lotus flowers and white ro lotus flowers are a little common, but blue lotus flowers are very rare. In fact, I've never seen one or met anyone who's seen one. <laughs> But the poetry is really nice. <laughs> it explains that the blue lotus remains in a closed state. It only blossoms when it is touched by the moonlight, by the rays of a full moon. When those rays of the full moon touch the lotus flower, it fully blossoms. And it's considered the symbol of beauty and has such a fragrance that spreads in all directions. Grace is compared to that moonshine. When our hearts is touched by the moon rays of grace, it blossoms, it awakens, and the beauty of our true self gives beauty to the whole world, and the fragrance of our love, our compassion, fills all direction. That is our potential. When we forget the true treasures within ourselves, we identify ourselves so much with the body and with the mind. And in that state, we're so vulnerable to the dualities of the world. Because the whole creation is built on the principle of dualities. And you can't have one side without the other, just like a coin. If you want the heads, you get the tails. You can't say, I want one without the other. They're inseparable. Similarly, happiness, distress, pleasure, pain, honor, dishonor, victory, defeat, health, disease, birth, death. If we're attached to one, then when our destiny flips over to the other side, it's going to cause us that much proportionate sorrow. But we're pleasure-seeking beings. We have to find it somewhere. If we're not finding it within ourselves, we have to find it through the dualities of this world. And if we don't see the spiritual essence in other people, we look for it in the dualities of people, too. And we become very vulnerable to frustration, to stress, to depression. The World Health Organization, they claimed that in this century we're living now, the third most um, prominent disease that's going to cause suffering 
is going to be depression, mental disease. Why? And this isn't just for people who don't have so much. It's for the people who don't have so much and the people who have everything and more but are still not satisfied. But there's another verse in Bhagavad Gita. Vishaya vini vartante niraharas yadehina rasavarajam rasopyasya param dristva nivartate. That we can rise above the dualities when we actually experience something higher, something deeper when we reconnect to our soul's own blissful, loving nature. So vai pung sang puro dharma yato bhakti rad hoksha je ahoyta ki aprati hata yayatma suprasiddhati. This beautiful Sanskrit verse tells that true yoga, real dharma, in its highest form, is that which awakens the natural qualities of love that is within our hearts. And that love is expressed through seva, through service. Seva means to serve out of love, out of compassion, not for tax benefits, not for selfish or egoistic reasons. There's a beautiful saying that you make a living by what you get and you make a life by what you give. Thank you. True dharma is when that propensity that is within us, that potential within us to love and to serve as an instrument of that grace. When we think ourselves to be the doer of our activities, we actually disconnect from that grace. But when we humble ourselves to understand that there is a higher power, bigger than me and bigger than all of us, that can actually manifest and flow through any of us. If we just clean our heart to receive it, then there's no arrogance. There's no obsessive need to prove that my nation is better than yours, or my religion is better than yours, or my sex is better than yours, or my, my race is better than you. People are so addicted with trying to prove their superiority. And it creates so much conflict. So much, if somebody's better than us, we're prone to get depressed or envious. If we do something better, then we're prone to be arrogant and condescending. From an enlightened perspective, these are all really weaknesses. The real strength is to really be everyone's well-wisher. That's our nature. When we connect to the immortal, eternal joy and love of that grace that nourishes us constantly. But unfortunately, we're bombarded by so many weapons of mass distraction in our lives. We've forgotten who we are. and what we have the potential to do. Unleashing the power of the soul 
comes when we simply awaken the love and the grace that is within us. A love and grace that no one and nothing can take away from us. Recently I was with one lady who was one of my very dear friends. She was in London and she was dying of cancer. I was in Mumbai and her husband called me and said she really wants to see you before she dies and the doctor gives her five more days to live. So I dropped everything I was doing and I made an arrangement to go to London by airplane. But then you know what happened? This was a few years ago. A volcano erupted in Iceland. Do you all remember that? And the ashes that came out of the volcano were so much that every airport in the entire continent of Europe and North Africa was closed and every flight was canceled. It's really interesting, the power of nature. Even from a tiny little island like Iceland, <laughs> it can disrupt the whole planet. But somehow or other, I made it there. It's a, it's a long story. <laughs> and I was at her bedside. And I arrived in the morning, and she, she passed away the next day. But she said something that was very powerful. She had six children. And she was a very dynamic woman. She was a mother and she was an activist. She was always trying to help people who were not getting fair treatment. And she was always having festivals to bring people together and she was very dynamic in every way. But now she's emaciated, she's paralyzed, people have to clean her excrement, people have to feed her intravenously. And she said, look at me, I'm, I'm nothing what I used to be. And then she smiled and she said, but I have unlimited relevance. <laughs> she said, do you know why? She approaches God as Krishna. She said, because Krishna loves me. And nothing and no one can ever take that love away from me. I can feel it. I can, I know who I am and where I'm going. And then she smiled even bigger. She said, Krishna loves me so infinitely, but I can't think myself better than anyone because God loves everyone infinitely. And the more we realize our own when, when we are touched by that love, we become instruments of that love. And we realize that that love is for everyone, everywhere, wherever there's life. Some are connected to it and some are disconnected. And spirituality is to reconnect. and to truly be everyone's well-wisher. I'll end with a wonderful little story. Again, it's about redwood trees. You see, compassion, compassion 
when it awakens from our heart, it's like the sun, it shines. When the sun shines, it doesn't discriminate who's fit or who's unfit. It shines for everyone. And that includes the environment. We showed this um, small video of our eco-village near Mumbai. And the very principle of this eco-village is what we're speaking about. Compassion to humans, to animals. We have cows and dogs and donkeys and sheep and goats and birds and someone just it was a racehorse, a thoroughbred racehorse that retired and they were about to send it to the slaughterhouse and the person couldn't afford to keep it but didn't want it to die so donated it to us. So now we have a horse. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is life is sacred and as human beings we are meant to be caretakers. Nothing is our property. We are caretakers of sacred property. And with whatever we have, whatever money, whatever property, whatever skills, whatever intelligence, whatever influence, its true fulfillment is when we use it for that higher purpose of compassion. And everyone is depending on, the, on the, the gifts of nature. According to the Vedic philosophy, nature is our mother. Just like an infant child is completely dependent on the mother. No matter who we are. We're completely dependent on the air to breathe, on the sunshine, on the rain, on the food, on the earth's gifts of fruits and flowers and trees and, and vegetables and grains. So it's not just a matter of making the earth a better place for our children and grandchildren. It's a matter of living in harmony and respect and compassion for the gifts of God through nature. A grateful heart is a humble heart, and a humble heart is a sensitive heart that has the capacity to actually love. So that's the principle of the eco-village. One of my favorite parts of it, of course, is the animals, and we grow all of our food. But sewage, it's a reality. We can't run away from it. <laughs> It doesn't matter who you are, still, the same things come out, right? It's, it's kind of an equalizer. <laughs> you may just be a simple person living in the streets of Mumbai, or you may be living in a beautiful palace, but when nature calls, you have to go, and it doesn't smell much different. <laughs> to see the potential of the resource of that, rather than just seeing it as waste. So we have a natural organic sewage refining system that makes the sewage water into very, very clean water. And every part of it can be used in a very, very invaluable, positive way. The place where the water is going through different herbs and roots and, and, and soil 
It's it's very ancient, traditional um, technologies that was put together. This is very interesting by a scientist. One of our students, he was, he, he modeled this sewage refinery for his PhD thesis for IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. It's one of the highest seats of learning in the planet. 60 Minutes, I think CBS, did a special on IIT and they had a very powerful man from India saying, I tried everything to get my son an IIT. Every year I think about 300,000 applicants and they accept 2,000. He said, I tried everything, but finally as an alternative I had to send him to Columbia University. <laughs> But he did his Ph.D. thesis on a sewage refinery, organic, natural, and we set it up at our eco-village. And the place where the sewage is, we have so many things growing. It's like, it's like a paradise up there. It's unbelievable. We have hundreds of papaya trees, and they're usually about this big. But if you go up there, they're about one and a half to two, two times as big. So some yoga group from New York came, some teachers, and they saw the size of the papayas up there. And the lady said, these are not papayas. These are poopayas. <laughs> <laughs> I did, that wasn't my words, those were. <laughs> But there's value in everything. If we, just, if we just have compassion, we'll look for how we can utilize every situation for the welfare of, of humanity, all beings in the world. So now I get back to my last story. I was walking through another redwood forest, and the park ranger had a group of tourists around him. And I was going there to get away from crowds, and I just wanted to be with nature. So when I saw a crowd of tourists, I tried to respectfully escape. But I heard the park ranger say something that stopped me. He said, I am going to tell you the underground secret of the redwood forest. No. Coming from Northern Illinois, being a teenager in the 1960s, some things just don't leave your heart. Even though I'm a Swami and everything, I'm still attracted to underground secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so I told my friend, let's listen to this. He said, these trees are the largest trees on earth, and the biggest trees, and the tallest trees. Usually for a tree to grow in a powerful way, they need deep roots. But the redwood tree's roots don't grow very deep. And here in Northern California, it's hilly ground. The soil is very loose. And some of these trees are a thousand or two thousand years old. And over that time, there have been devastating earthquakes, massive storms, snow, blizzards. How do the trees just keep growing and growing? Then he revealed the underground secret. The redwood roots underground, not so deep, they reach outward toward the roots of other trees. And the roots of two trees, when they meet, they intertwine with each other. They embrace. They form a permanent knot. 
In this way, every tree in the entire forest, the ranger said, is directly or indirectly connected to and giving support to every other tree. And even the little tiny trees that have little thin roots, they wrap around these ancient giant roots and get support from them. And the big roots are wrapping against around each other. They're all helping. Unity is their strength. Because in their own natural way, with their own intelligence, they care about each other. And that's a lesson for all of us. The roots of a tree is the deepest part of the tree. It's like the heart of the tree. And when our hearts extend to one another in a spirit of compassion, in a spirit of care, when it comes from soul to soul, that naturally includes the body and the mind, then we have strength. And then whatever storms may come in life, we're there for each other. And this is Dharma. This is the power of the soul. Thank you. I'm trying to understand more about Dharma, and my elementary understanding is more along the lines that it's like a person's personality, like what they are meant to do. But when you spoke of Dharma this evening, it was always maybe maybe for somebody who's at a higher level that I guess, but the Dharma is to be closer to God and 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 more connected to God. Could you tell me more about Dharma, please? Thank you very much. There are various levels and definitions of Dharma. But like a tree, there's the root understanding of Dharma and then it's how it expands in various ways into the world. Sometimes Dharma is translated as occupation. Sometimes Dharma is translated as religion. Sometimes Dharma is explained in one's particular status or role in society. So Dharma can mean many things, but the original Sanskrit, because it is a Sanskrit word, it means that which is inseparable from its own nature. An example, the, ex the inseparable quality of who we are is what Dharma is. The Dharma of sugar is it's sweet. The Dharma of water is liquid. Now, in January, here in northern Illinois, it becomes ice. <laughs> but as soon as the weather becomes warmer, the ice naturally becomes liquid again, because that's its nature. It can be transformed by circumstances in the environment, but it's nature. In India, the nature of a chili pepper is it's hot. This is a quality that is inseparable from the thing. So what is the inseparable quality of the atma or the soul or of who we are? And this is what we're describing. When we live, we naturally serve. We either serve our mind and senses or we serve our boss, or we serve the government by giving 
taxes or we serve our husband or our wife or our children or our parents. It's natural to serve. And the origin of that quality of service is in the love that is within our heart, the love that is our true potential, that is expressed through service. So loving service to the root and to all parts of the tree of life is the actual original translation of the meaning of dharma in the Sanskrit language. So dharma is, in this sense, the very essence of all religions, the very essence of all true philosophies the very, the highest essence of whatever we do. And in the name of religion today, there's so much sectarian arguments, there's arrogance, there's hatred, there's fear, there's insecurity, but it's always been like that. Why? If we actually find the essence of our religion, then we'll be able to recognize that essence elsewhere. In this book that I wrote, The Journey Home, I was living on the bank of the Ganges River in a place called Patna. And I was, I was about 20 years old at the time. And there was a man about 85, his name was Narayan Prasad. He was a devotee of Ram in the Hindu faith. And every we became best friends. He was older than my grandfather, <laughs> but we were friends. And he would take me every day to meet his best friend, who owned an x-ray clinic and his name was Mohammed. And he would close the x-ray clinic at around noon every day, and we'd go into the little back room, and Mohammed would discuss the Quran, and Narayan Prasad would discuss the Ramayan and the Gita, and I would discuss all the different things I learned. <laughs> and it was, it was, real sharing and inspiring. And one day I was sitting with Narayan Prasad and I asked him, in a country like India where there's so much conflict between Hindus and Muslims, how is it that you're best friends with a Muslim? And he's best friends with you. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, a dog will always recognize his or her master. Whether the master is in a suit and tie, or whether the master is in a bathing suit, or whether the, the master is naked, the dog will recognize its master. If we cannot recognize our beloved God, when he or she comes in another dress for other people at another time, then we have so much to learn from the dog. Dharma is that essence. We quoted from the Bible, the first and great commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if that if that is understood, then naturally we will love our neighbor as ourself. And everyone is our neighbor. That's the first and great commandment. And we cited from the Vedas, Savai Pung Sang Puro Dharma Yato Bhakti Adapokshicha. The Supreme Dharma is that which awakens our inherent love. 
a love that is not motivated by selfishness or egoism and can never be interrupted by circumstances. Because it's who we are, the awakening of that love. So that is the most essential understanding of Dharma from the Vedic perspective. When you talk about Dharma, and uh, can I interpret like, see, because uh, in your process of journey, you went through at early age and integrated the body, mind, heart, and get to the level of understanding the grace. But uh, people like us in a household lifestyle, we don't have that um, opportunity of integrating body, mind, and heart to realize the grace part. Before we get to the grace part, we get caught up in the body-mind uh, uh, dichotomy of um, uh, body dharma is to pain pleasure drama and uh, mind drama is to uh, give and receive i'm giving more you're not giving in a, in a relationship i'm talking about so we get caught up in that drama of body dharma and uh, mind dharma and we just just create our own chaos not even realizing the chaos is happening in, in a relationship before it's too late and almost to the destructive level so when you're talking, you're not even talking about pain, pleasure, happiness, and happiness, joy. But beyond these three, you're doc talking about um, grace. We never even get to the level of understanding the value of grace. So as a householder, how could we get to where we are? Uh, if you could help us understand that, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you just gave a better lecture than me, actually. <laughs> I'd like to tell a little story. Some years ago, I was giving a lecture at a university in India for certified and chartered accountants. And I gave a talk, something like what I, on the subject that they gave me. And afterward, I asked for questions. Now, when you're in a university in India and you ask for questions, you have to sometimes, you know, you have experience. <laughs> Somebody raised their hand. And I was up there on the podium, and I innocently called on him. And as soon as he stood up, everyone in the auditorium, there was about 300 people, they all went, ooh. I could see that he was very charismatic and well-known on campus. <laughs> he started screaming at me. He said, you are, you are a cheater. I reject everything you said. And he went on and on. He said, what if everyone in the world became a swami like you? Who would grow the food? Who would run the governments? Who would do the banking? Who would do the farming? If everyone became a swami like you, the world would be a total mess. Therefore, I have to reject everything you say, and we should, everybody in this room should reject whatever you say because you're simply cheating us. He got a standing ovation. <laughs> the students were cheering and clapping and howling and cheering because people like to see the teacher get massacred. <laughs> so, I was standing there waiting for the commotion, too quiet, and I said a little prayer. And about a minute after all this applauding and howling, when it became quiet, 
Would you like to hear my answer? I said, thank you very much, sir. But I have a question for you. What if everyone in the world became an accountant like you? <laughs> Who would do the farming? Who would run the governments? Who would do the banking? Who would do all the transportation? Who would run the businesses? I said, in fact, if everyone in the world became an accountant like you, there would be a 100% unemployment rate because no one would need an accountant. <laughs> and everyone was quite quiet. I said, just like a body, there are different organs and limbs in the body, and each one has its own shape and its own color and its own specific function. The heart cannot do what the brain does. The lungs cannot do what the pancreas does. The kidneys cannot do what the knees do. The stomach cannot do what the eyes do. But is every part of the body thinking, I'm the best? Everyone should recognize only me? That would be a very unhealthy body. A healthy body, every part of the body appreciates the function of every other part. It's not one is better than another. They're all in harmony because they all appreciate unity in diversity. And that's a healthy body. So similarly, a healthy social body is when we can all appreciate each other. I said there's a need for farmers, and there's a need for bankers, and there's a need for business people, and there's a need for accountants. And there's some need for swamis like me, too. <laughs> so instead of battling each other and who's better, we should appreciate what we're all contributing and work to and serve together, like those redwood trees. In Bengal, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, one of the greatest saints that ever lived. His name was Bhaktivinoda Thakur. This person wrote dozens of books, thousands and thousands of songs and prayers and hymns. His wife was Bhagavati and she was as saintly as him. They had 10 children. He worked as a magistrate, a judge, during the British regime in India. And he was such an efficient person in his role that the British government, just so that he could try more cases, because he was so thorough, he was such a spiritual, compassionate man of such high integrity and dignity. Their stories were even if the person being tried was found guilty by him, they would thank him <laughs> because they really understood. If he's finding me guilty, it must be good for me because he was such a compassionate man of such high dignity and such love. And even the most renounced yogis and babas and sadhus would come down from holy places in Himalayas to sit and hear his teachings and ask for his blessings. Because he simply integrated these spiritual principles in his life. In one of his poems, he sings, 
गृहे ताको वन्ने ताको सदा हरि बोले ताको सुखे दुखे बोलो ना को परने हरि नाम को रोरे गाय गोड़ा माधु स्वारे Whether one is in family life, working a job, taking care of parents, taking care of children, having an occupation, or whether one is a sadhu living in the Himalayas in the jungles or a swami traveling around, it really doesn't matter. These are all like the different organs of the body that are serving serpent. You know, we're all trying to serve each other in our own ways. In family life, it's the perfect opportunity for enlightenment and for being instruments of grace if we just apply some simple principles. Understanding Bhaktaram Jagatapa Samsarva Loka Maheshwaram, that everything is the property of the divine, or everything is the property of God. I'm a caretaker. These, my husband is God's child. My wife is child of the divine, entrusted in my care. These children are entrusted in my care. In this way, we are caretakers. We're not proprietors. And we have responsibility for the body, mind, and souls. And if we have a spiritual foundation, then, we, then whatever we do in our occupation or in our um, social responsibilities and family responsibilities, we build on that foundation. And the foundation is, I'm the eternal soul. I'm a part of God, and everyone is. So let me live by these principles. Some of the most enlightened people I ever met have families. They work hard. I know one person, he works so hard in his business and he's really successful. But he's feeding hundreds and thousands of children in the ghetto schools every day. He's helping widows to survive. He's funding orphanages. He's following ashrams. He's finding spiritual educational centers in a very universal way. He's built hospitals. And even monks, they see that this person is more enlightened than they are. But they all work together. <laughs> so grace is there for everyone. And whatever role we are in society is the perfect situation for us. If we just get inspired by enlightening people and get direction and have a spiritual process, we chant God's names as our primary spiritual process and meditation on these holy mantras. So the through, 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 our, through our study, through our yoga, through our spiritual practice, we develop a foundation. We give some time to that because we understand it's important. And then with the grace and with the inner fulfillment and with the love that we discover through our spiritual practice, in our community, then we share it, we express it in whatever we do. And then life is beautiful. My question was, uh, Swamiji, thank you for tonight, by the way. Uh, my question was uh, regarding seva and how ego gets in the way when there is a success during seva. Can you help uh, emphasize on what an ideal seva should be like. <laughs> the, 
Seva is an attitude. Prakriti kriyamana ni gunai karmani saravasha. Ahankara vimudatma. That let me give an example of this person I'm talking about who has a wife and three children and the wife it does everything he does. Um, when they're serving, they actually kept it secret, even from me. After years, our accountant came and said, nobody knows this except me, but I have to tell somebody. At least you should know it. This is what this person's doing for so many people. Some of the things I knew, but many of the things I really didn't know. He really cared. He didn't want prestige. He didn't want his name and lights. He just wanted to help because he loved. He took care of his family with full heart, but then he extended to see the whole world as his family also and try to help in whatever way he could. And when I asked him, he just had a very humble smile. He said, no, no. He said, don't think I'm great. He said, whatever God gives me is for everyone. It's not mine. He's a millionaire. <laughs> but I don't know how much he keeps, you know. <laughs> he wanted to move out of his beautiful home to, to a small apartment. And I said, better you stay in your home. Because if you're in your small apartment, the message of who you are will not be as effective. If people come to your home and see the humility of your service, they'll understand that they don't have to become swamis. <laughs> they can be who they are, where they are. But if we have a good spiritual foundation, when we succeed, we won't become arrogant. We'll actually be humbled by that. When we're praised, our ego will not inflate. We'll be humbled by it. Because we'll be grateful. A grateful heart does not become falsely proud. Only an ungrateful heart can become falsely proud. A grateful heart is humble. It means whatever niceness or even whatever meanness comes to me. There's something for me to learn. There's a way for me to grow. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the good times and the hard times. I'm grateful for whatever success or failure is there because it gives me a chance to learn, to serve and to love and ultimately to grow. So when we're grateful for what we're given, then we'll be very eager to share it with humility. And that's just a symptom of a spiritual connection. And however spiritual or religious a person may profess to be, if they're proud, if they're not grateful, if they're not humble, if they're not eager to serve, we can understand that there's not much of a connection there because that's the real connection. 